Well, thank you. You're too kind. Before we actually do that, I want to recognize the fact that school has begun for some kids. Some are going back in the next week or so. I just want to pause before I dive into the message and offer a prayer. Um, Because our students are going back into a a community in which they devote so many hours of their week. In fact, they spend more waking hours at school Monday through Friday than they do at home. And many of you are school teachers, administrators, homeschool parents. You've got a great challenge before you as you pour into our kids. Um, Teachers can have a great influence on the life of a kid, especially when you represent Christ in the school system. And so I want to ask if you're a student, if you're a teacher, homeschool teacher, parent, if you're an administrator, would you stand right now? I just want to say a prayer of blessing over you as you embark on this new um, school year of 2015. Father, I thank you for these students. I thank you for these young ones who are at the prime of life, Father. They're soaking up knowledge, but they're building friendships. They're starting to discern where... You want to take them in their lives, and I pray, Father, that you would make them strong in their faith as they go back to school. I pray that they would be representatives of you in their schools, Father. There's a lot of pressure to conform to the world. I pray that they'd be strong as they live for you, and I pray for those teachers, Father, those who stand in the midst of the schools, Lord, that they could represent you, that they can be a safe place for kids, that they can be faithful in their jobs, but also, Father, that through their lifestyle, kids may ask them questions about their personal life, about their faith, and why they are the way they are. And I pray for those who... Uh, make decisions, superintendents, principals, administrators, Father. For those that are homeschool parents, I pray a blessing on them, Father, as they make decisions that affect lives, sometimes forever. So we just commit them to you, Father. May this be an incredible school year, and may we partner it together as a church, Lord, as we raise up the next generation to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, yesterday, uh, it was movie day, so I got to go see Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. What a, I'm not a big Tom Cruise fan, but this was an action-packed movie. He plays the character Ethan Hunt really well. And you know, if you know the Mission Impossible kind of scenario, he gets a mission at the very beginning, whether he chooses to accept it or not, and then this thing self-destructs. Of course, he always does the mission and succeeds in it. I don't know why it's called Mission Impossible, because it's possible. You know, maybe Mission Difficult or Mission Formidable or Mission Improbable, but not Mission Impossible, because he always does it. You know, to have a mission that seems so daunting is, uh, is what the church has. When, when Jesus gathered his disciples before him and said, now you, you guys, you 12, are going to go out into the world. Actually, it was 11 by that time because Judas had fallen off the wagon. So now you got 11 here. You're going to go out and change the whole world. And then they go, mission impossible. And yet God did it. And the reason we even exist here today is because they were faithful with it. Well, we as a church have a mission. And it's to help more people more often say yes to God. And then the community in which God has placed us, in the time era in which we live, culture in which we live in, um, we've asked ourselves, how does that play out? What does that look like? What do we want to see in the church as we move forward? And over the last several years, as we've prayed as leaders and and looked at things, we've concluded there are four key elements um, to that vision. And so uh, last week, I covered the first two with you. And then today, I'm going to go over the last to with you. And so if you have a bulletin there, you might flip it over. Some of you weren't here. I want to cover some ground that we covered last week just to bring you up to speed on it, that there are four key things we want to be about as a church. We want to, we want to be a church that does these things, both for you and through you. Number one is connecting seekers, connecting seekers. Yesterday, I was, I was driving back from the movie theater, came up Mesa Ridge Parkway, and there was a little blue car that zoomed past me, and something flew off of that car. I didn't know what it was, but it looked kind of like a cell phone. And I thought either someone threw it out the sunroof or someone went and got gas and left the cell phone on top of their car and finally decided to launch at that point. But I pulled off to the side of the road because I lost a cell phone on a road once. And uh, fortunately, I found it. So I pulled off, ran back, and fortunately, no, none of the cars had driven over it yet, grabbed an iPhone. And I pushed a little button there, and, the, and it came on. I figured someone is going to be looking for this. So I took it home waited around, had to put my charger on it to start getting some uh, battery life back into this phone. And about a half hour later, um, and if you have an iPhone, you know what this is. That beep, 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 beep. They're looking for their phone. And they, and, and they know where it is, or at least the general vicinity. And I thought, I don't know if that's good, because I don't know who this person is. They're gonna, we're going to have some stranger come knocking at the door and say, you've got my phone, turn it over. Um, 
So I'm waiting, and they do what I'm hoping they would do in the first place. The phone rings about 10 minutes later, and they say, who is this? I thought, are you serious? You're asking who I am? I'm the one with the power. Who are you? So she says, well, I'm Brittany, and I lost my phone, and I think you have it. <laughs> you think I have it? That's a talking to you on your <laughs> phone. So I said, yeah, I've got it. And I told her what happened. So I met her on the corner out in our neighborhood. And then she was so excited to get her cell phone back. The, the screen was shattered, but they can replace that. Those phones are amazing, when you have a, especially when you have a cover on it that protects it. But you know what? People are searching for stuff all the time that they think is important. And there are things in life that are far more important than cell phones. Things like purpose and, uh, and joy and something of lasting value. And so um, people try all kinds of things. They'll try drugs. They'll, they'll think it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, or getting married, having a baby. Try all kinds of things to find that missing piece. We just get this one thing. But you and I know, at least I hope you know, I, I have no doubts about this, that the one true thing that satisfies every heart is Jesus Christ. That there's no thing no person that you can put in that place in your life that can fulfill what God designed you for Jesus Christ. And so that's why this is so important for us to connect seekers. And what it means is to bring the spiritually searching into a dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. We want to be like a matchmaking service to introduce people to really Mr. Right. And not only to have a relationship with him, but his bride, the church. Because it's in the context of, of growing in a church that we really um, reach our full spiritual potential, which leads us into the second thing we are about as a church. It's growing believers. Growing believers. And growing believers is this, leading people deeper in their faith in Christ and love for others. There's a lot of things you can do in the area of spiritual growth, but it really boils down to trusting Jesus more and more and loving people more and more. And if you're doing those two things, you're doing pretty well spiritually. Now, spiritual growth is a very personal thing, but it's not limited to that. And here's where our culture has tried to box in the church. You keep your spirituality private. Keep it to yourself. Keep it within the walls of your church, but we don't need it in the government. We don't need it in the schools. We don't need it out in the public. Just keep it to yourselves. And here's the problem. You cannot keep your relationship with Jesus Christ to yourself because once he comes into your life, he's restless. He wants an expression. He loves the world out there, and he won't let you be quiet. And so you may even be a person, and I've had people tell me this. Well, my faith in Jesus is a very personal thing. Oh, yeah, let it be your own personal thing. But, it, but, but don't make it so private that it doesn't spill out into the public area. I know a lot of athletes will say that and other people. I'm just an advocate of, of letting, letting your true colors show. I mean, I've already seen someone today with the Bronco shirt on. You know, and people are going to start wearing their colors this fall. You know, orange and different, different teams and the star on your shirt over there. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're proud of those things. Well, is there anything to be more proud of than our relationship with Jesus Christ? Is there anything we want the world to know about us more than the fact that we love Jesus Christ? So it has to spill over into the public arena. And so as people come to know Jesus Christ, as they become... Uh, involved in a local church like ours, as they grow in their faith, it doesn't end there. And that's where we're going today with the last two of these, uh, what we call critical success factors or, or, or primary areas of our vision. And before we do these two, I, I want to ask you to pray. I want to ask you to, to open yourself up to God, to let him speak to you. One of the beliefs we have as a church is that God speaks in a very present way into our lives. And the Holy Spirit prompts us and nudges us and moves us Probably not an audible voice you hear, but it would be a pull in a Godward direction. And I pray for you that he does that today to you. So um, he can do that if you open yourself to him. Father, thank you right now. We pause in the midst of a busy morning. There's a lot of things we have to do after church, but right now, in this moment, maybe the most dedicated moment of our whole week, would we, would we offer ourselves to you, that you would be Lord, that you would be the voice we hear above all other voices, Lord. Whatever it is you ask us to do, no matter how dangerous, no matter how costly, no matter what changes it would require of me, give me the courage to say yes. In Jesus' name, amen. When you grow spiritually, I was thinking about this, and, and, and forgive me if it sounds kind of corny, but it just kind of came out in this, this rhyme, and I couldn't get away from it because it said it so well, that, that growth ends up like this. You grow and grow till you overflow. 
changing people at home and wherever you go. That growth is something that bubbles up and you cannot contain it. It's like fruit on a tree. If, if, it, if a fruit tree grows and grows and grows, it will overflow with an abundance of fruit. And if you keep growing, you cannot contain it. It will spill out starting in the very dearest relationships, your own family. Several years ago, and we decided this would be one of our um, focal points as a church, it was for this reason. We live in a community known for families with focus on the family here. And, of course, churches always say that we're pro-family. We love the family. And yet, there's been this nagging thing that I've observed, that families aren't doing too well in the church, that marriages aren't doing real well in the church. And there's something very strange when you watch children grow up in the church and leave the church. If we can't lead our own children to faith in Christ, how in the world can we sell what we're trying to peddle to the world, saying, you guys need Christ, but, you know, my kids don't believe it? It doesn't work. And I think really deep down inside, we say, yes, we want to convey to our kids. We want to have a marriage that's God-honoring. We just don't really know how to do that. And that's why we as a church realize we've got to help partner with families. And so strengthening families is this third focus of our vision. And what does that mean? It's equipping families to live and lead a legacy of faith. God's desire is for moms and dads to first enter a relationship with God and then become the primary spiritual influencers in the lives of their children. And maybe you're someone who grew up in a home like that, and thank God you had a mom or dad that really loved the Lord and modeled it. What I find in our church, and I don't think our church is a whole lot different than many, is most of us did not grow up with that. Even if you grew up with a church background, you grew up like I did a Methodist church or another church by a name, that doesn't guarantee that you bought into the faith that your parents had. You brought into the name, but not the faith. And without a faith in Jesus Christ, without a personal relationship with you, religion becomes dry, religion becomes just a duty. It's not vital, it's not vibrant. And so, moms and dads, the, the best thing you can do for your family is to establish a relationship with Jesus. And you know, when I watch TV, you see all these sitcoms, uh, family sitcoms, and I watch those family sitcoms, and they usually end up pretty well. They, they turn out pretty, I mean, they have their issues, but they're, they're, they're a happy family. They stay together. They don't, they don't go through divorce. Kids don't abandon the family typically. But you know the families I know? And I'm talking about the families I know within my own family. There's suicide. There's divorce. There's, there's fighting. There, there's people who won't see each other anymore. There's people who've cut us off from their lives. And I don't think my life is a whole lot different than many of you. It's not the, the, the beautiful TV happy family that we watch. And the sad thing is, is we have Jesus on our side. And yet, for some reason, we've not figured out how to make it work. Well, here's the key, Psalm 127.1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Jesus builds two things. He said he would build his church. He said he would build our home. Now, when he said he'd build the church, he wasn't talking about church buildings. He's talking about the body of believers. When he's talking about the home, the house, he's not talking about the physical structure of a house. Of course, Jesus doesn't build your house. What's he talking about? Your family. He wants to build your family. And so when you allow him to come in and say, okay, I want to learn from you. I want to do it your way. Just amazing things start to happen. When you decide to say, I really want my marriage to, to, to be done in a way that honors Jesus, it will transform your marriage. When you decide to parent in a way that, that pleases God, that invites God into your home in a very tangible kind of a way, it's not just a church thing, but really Jesus is Lord of our home, it really transforms the people within that home. And so we want you to experience that. We want you to have that as part of your life. Psalm 127, verse 3, goes on to say that children are a heritage from the Lord, children are a reward from him. Children are a gift. They're not a burden, they're a blessing. They're like arrows, he says, that you raise up and launch out into the world. Psalm 78, verse 4, says, We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, like grandchildren. And they, in turn, would tell their children, great-grandchildren. Then they would put their trust in God. 
That is the legacy we want. We want to see generation after generation trusting in God. I had lunch the, the other day with a man. He's at a family reunion right now. He said he's got about 30 um, relatives within his family that are pastors across this country. 30. And you may think I pity that man and his family, but many of us don't have a single one. But wouldn't it be great to have a legacy of Christian servants and leaders within your family? Uh, for many of us, we're first generation. What if you look down your family tree and you see your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids walking with the Lord, sitting in church together, worshiping side by side? Wouldn't that be fantastic? Is that what we desire? So strengthening families is, is number three on our list. And we as a church want to come along beside, offer classes, seminars, whatever we can do to help you. But the best thing we can offer you is, is an example, is an example. To be around other couples, to be in a life group, to get near people in our church who've, who've endured. Well, they're perfect by any means. None of us are perfect, but have endured. Uh, yesterday, I was helping my son move some furniture into his little townhouse. He's getting married next month. And uh, two people told me that morning that I needed to back off on giving my son too much instruction. Oh, I've got a lot more experience than him. And we were moving some furniture, and I said, you know, I really think that piece of furniture needs to go in this place. I think you're going to regret it if you don't put it there. And, you know, I lobbied strongly for my viewpoint. Let's just say that. <laughs> and then later, I was instructed by a sweet voice of my wife of, I need to let him own his own decisions. I need to let him make mistakes if they need to be made. That that's one of the best ways that you learn. But they need to be his decisions, not yours. I mean, these aren't moral issues. These are just stylistic things and cultural. And you know what I did? I then, about an hour later, saw him and said, hey, son, I'm sorry. You know, in, in my intentions to help you avoid some things that I think you'll regret down the road, probably became a little too pushy. And I'm going to try to learn to back off a little bit for you. And he says, yeah, Dad, you're right. And I, I appreciate that. I'm still learning. And I'm 54, almost 55 years old. And so all of us are still learning. So you don't have to be perfect. But if we humbly keep learning, it's amazing what an apology can do to erase the hurts of the past and move forward. Yet so many of us get bogged down. And Satan knows how to leverage those buttons and push you. And so you, you live in the past and all the hurts and dysfunction. And God says, I want to get you past that. So number four, the fourth area that spills over as we grow and grow and it overflows, it not only will change people at home, but people wherever we go, that's where the communities come in, impacting communities. The communities are the neighborhood in which you live in. It's the city in which you live in. It's the metropolis in which you live in. It's the the work environment in which you work in. It's the school in which you go. Those are all kind of communities within our lives, all circles of people that we have an opportunity to influence. And oftentimes as a church, I find that we, we play this escape game that I'm going to go to church and get fed, and then I'm going to make this mad dash back to my house to get away from this bad, bad world out there that's so corrupt and so evil. And yet the church isn't meant to be a hideout, like a bomb shelter. It's meant to be a launching pad that equips us then to go back into the world, to, to be agents of change within that world. Uh, the church isn't to be a fortress, it's to be a force. Jesus himself said, um, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what he means by that is the church is moving out into the area where Satan's kind of put his gates, said this is my territory, to say no, 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 it's Jesus' territory. And we're gonna knock those gates down because this is a place where he needs to be honored and glorified. So what does it mean to impact communities? It, it means that we're going to bring people to Jesus Christ by bringing Christ to people. You know, one of the best things that we can do as a church is be a, a, a great presence in this community. That, that when we gather for church, we really offer something sub, of substance to people. That we really do church well when people come here on Sunday morning. So when you invite your friends to come to church, you're expecting something to happen. And we want to be part of that. We want to deliver that. But we also want to equip you then when you go out into the world to infiltrate the world, to, to look at the people that God has placed in your life and to begin to witness to them. And a witness has two parts. It's both good works and good news. It, it both it has to do with our conduct, how we serve, how we carry ourselves, the attitude that we bring. 
but it also has to do with the conversation, what we talk about. Because when you have great conduct, it sets a tone for good conversation. Now, you can go preach on a street corner and tell people to go to hell without Jesus. I don't think you're going to be very successful in reaching people for Christ. But if you love people and if you invest in people and then you earn their right to be heard, uh, the likelihood that they'll listen to you goes way up. And God wants us to take Christ. Christ lives in us, right? So bring that Christ in, that's living in you to the people around you. And it can happen in a number of different ways, but really it boils down to this. Bring positive change. Make a positive impact on those around you. It might be by bringing a meal to someone. It might be by helping them change their tires. It might be by, by coaching a little league baseball team and being a representative. It might be, be by being a, a public school teacher. Some of you have, have a great platform right where you are to represent Christ at your job. You don't have to go all over the world in order to do that. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our witness opens the doors. Jesus also said in Matthew 28 that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. And so we can't keep it to ourselves. We've got to move out. But that verse can also be translated like this. As you go, make disciples of all nations. Meaning in your travels, in your journeys, in your lifestyle, make disciples of all nations. And so we can't all go overseas. We can't all go to Thailand and and New Zealand, and Africa, to be missionaries. But, but sometimes we get so caught up into thinking, I can't do anything for God unless I go on these big trips when God has placed opportunities right beneath us. There's a man in our community, his name's Alan Briggs. He helps train church planters. He's written his first book. It's called Staying is the New Going. And in his book, he says that when Jesus first gave that great commission in order to reach people, you really had to travel to the ends of the earth to reach them. But here's what's happening in the 21st century. The nations are coming to us. They're coming to our universities. They're coming to our military bases. They're coming to our cities. And so even in a congregation like this, you've got people from the Philippines. You've got people uh, from Africa. You've got people from South America. You've got people from Canada. You've got people from all over the world that are living right in our city. And then we get to send out these these military folks to other bases all over the world. And so we have an opportunity. And so here's what Alan, Alan Briggs did. He said, you know what? Sometimes we get so focused on learning villages in far parts of the world that we don't even know our, our neighbors' names. So as he walked his kids to school, he started to engage in the parents they met along the sidewalk. He started to uh, um, have parties at his home or coffee, free coffee Fridays where people would gather on a corner and just have coffee. He moved his grill from the deck and back to the porch in front and said people now as they walk by stop and talk. He said it's opened up all kinds of opportunities to share Christ with people. In fact, he says now every so often we'll get a knock on the door late at night because a neighbor is in crisis. And before we had no relationship, they never would have sought us out, but now they do. Staying can be the new going as we love the people around us. You are in a position that God has placed you to make a difference. Now I want to introduce you to a friend of mine that is finishing up his eighth year as a president of the school board for the Fountain School District. And, and Tom, would you kind of come up here and share a little bit? Uh, the, Tom was sharing with me the other day. He gave his last speech to the, to the teachers, and it was a very passionate speech. And I love the fact that he's not shy about letting people know that Jesus plays a significant part in his life. So would you welcome my friend Tom Downing. Thank you. Thank you, church family. I certainly do appreciate that. Um, my journey began <clears throat> here to the Fountain Valley. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was a young firefighter in Hawaii, and my wife and I, this was our final assignment in service of the Air Force, was here in Fountain. And we got here, and it was going well. This is a beautiful community, a great place to raise a family. Uh, and at the time that our, our children were entering the, the teenage years and entering high school, our son was a football player uh, and a wrestler. Some of you know him. His name is Michael. And uh, Michael developed what we thought was a hip pointer uh, during, during what we thought was a sports injury. We went to the hospital. We found out that wasn't a sports injury. Uh, he had a, a tumor in his hip bone that had monastitized into his lungs, and he had developed Ewing sarcoma, <coughs> a bone cancer. And, and I would just share with you, uh, through that journey uh, with our son, it was the most difficult uh, time as parents. Uh, the, the battle to battle this cancer that was in his body 
Uh, we had to allow doctors to pour poison in his body called chemotherapy. We had to endure several surgeries and watch them cut him up, and we had to endure radiation, which burn, burns on his body. And I have to tell you, it was a very difficult time. And uh, our son enjoyed being two places. One was church. He enjoyed serving here and, and, and being in the youth program. He also loved being in school. And those were the two places he loved to be. And, and, and during that time, the most difficult time as a parent, uh, we were loved on by our community. And, and to include that was many teachers. We had teachers that took time out of their schedules, came and tutored Michael in our home. We had coaches when we were weary uh, that would come to our home and just coach him up and encourage him and, and just get him through another day. Uh, and we had his classmates. Uh, when he was hit with his cancer, we did not treat this like a stigma. Uh, in our family, we opened up our doors, and we knew that the love that would come through through those students and through his classmates and his teammates uh, would help him, uh, would strengthen him, and would help him grow. And so we opened up our doors through that. And so uh, those of you know know that this journey ended with our son going home to the Lord. And um, I would share with you, we're a family of strong faith. Uh, we know how this story ends, and we're looking forward to the reunion. Thank you. The... Um, process of, of going through that, um, it's very humbling to allow someone to come in your home and to serve you. It, it's very, there were times where I came in my home, there were people cleaning our home. There were times I came in my home that people were cooking in my home that I didn't know who they were. And uh, they, they would ask, you know, sir, would you like a sandwich? I would love a sandwich. Thank you. No idea who they are, but they're, they're serving. <laughs> and, 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 and I would tell you that uh, I was asking God, you know, it's a natural thing to want to give back. And, and, and God opened up an opportunity. Just a few months after our son passed away, there was an opening on the school board at Fountain Fort Carson School District. And uh, I prayed about it, I seek counsel on it, and, and after an election was able to be blessed with the opportunity to serve back to our community. Uh, during the time as a school board president, I've been able to make sure that we're building facilities that are safe and will protect them. We've been able to compensate and we've been able to reward them, we've been able to recognize them, we've been able to encourage them. And uh, through that service, I would share with you that each time that I enter a school, each time I enter a sideline, each time that I'm at this school, my prayer to God is, God, please let them see you in me. And, and I would share with you, this journey started years before. And you don't know what Lord is, is preparing you for. When I was growing up in Detroit, Michigan, uh, I grew up in a very poor part of Detroit. I grew up where it was a rat roach infested ghetto neighborhood. I slept on a mattress with no sheets or pillows, and, and it was a rough, violent place to grow up. My mom remarried later in life, and it allowed me the opportunity to go to Gross Point, Michigan, which is like the Beverly Hills of Michigan, and uh, it was a very, very unique culture. I was the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air before the show ever aired, okay? <laughs> and, 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 and I was blessed that I had a school teacher named Ray Ritter. Ray Ritter was there for me. He, you know, when, when it was an environment that I didn't feel well accepted or loved on, Ray, my, my teacher and my coach, loved on me, accepted me. I would go to him every day before school. We would spend time together. We'd spend fellowship together. I was drawn to him. What I didn't know is that was the fruits of the Spirit. That was a Holy Spirit that was in him, that was alive, that was coming out, that just had a strong draw to me and a presence for him. When I uh, graduated high school, my gift that Ray gave me was a Bible. He gave me a Bible. And so uh, later that year in a dorm room in the Air Force, out at Edwards Air Force Base, it was that Bible that led me to the Lord. It was a friend of mine through that Bible that was able to witness and lead me to the Lord. And so I, I would share with you, it was more than just that, that gift of the Bible. All my life, all my life, um, as a young father, when I struggled, I would call Ray. As a young husband, when I was messing up, I would call Ray. As a young Christian, when I was struggling in my spiritual growth, I would call Ray. And so that's what Darren's talking about, that one person, as, as Doris shared earlier, that one person that can impact your life through the love of Christ. That was that person in my life. And so, as Darren said, a lot of us do a lot of great things in this church, but there are so many opportunities in our community right here. And, and if, if the Lord is leading you or tugging at your heart, I would just encourage you to follow that lead. God is good. Thank you. Thank you. You need to know this. 
You don't have to have a, a Bible degree, a pastoral hat to do ministry. God has placed you in circles that some of us will never, ever um, go into. And so as you go back to school, kids, start to say, God, use me. Use me to transform my school. It's amazing what God does through a person who's yielded to him. Your place where you're working, let God use you. Some of you, God's going to move into positions of, of authority. And maybe you will work for city government or you work for a school board or someplace, but just let God use you where you are. If you get a call to go to the ends of the earth, then do that. But don't sit still. Don't sit still. Grow and grow till it overflows. So let me ask you two questions. Number one, is Jesus transforming your marriage and family relationships? Is he doing that? Or is your faith just a, something that's contained in you? If he's not, then say, God, I need you to do that. I need you to transform those relationships. I need you to be Lord of my home. And then where has God opened a door for you to share Christ? God has given you a platform unlike the platform he's given anybody else. How are you using it for him? And I know sometimes we feel overwhelmed by this. God, this seems like a mission that's impossible. But it is possible through Jesus and the Holy Spirit he gives. When the church first began and they gave that mission to his disciples and they thought this was overwhelming, here's what they did. They gathered in an upper room and they poured themselves out to God. They prayed. They said, God, use us. God, God, fill us. We can't do this thing you've called us to do. And then the day of Pentecost, God filled them with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak boldly. They began to love boldly. They began to trust him in great ways. And God birthed a movement that has transformed the world. There are churches now all over this world because those followers yielded themselves to Jesus. What would happen if you and I today would just say, God, use me. God, like a vessel, fill me. Holy Spirit, fill me so full that I overflow with your love, power, and witness. What would happen if God would do that in your life? What would happen to your home? What would happen to this community? Well, I want to make that our prayer today. So I'm going to ask all of us to stand. If you're willing to be bold to say this prayer, sing this song as a song for you personally. That when you say, Holy Spirit, fill this place, it's not this room, it's this place right here. Fill this place and work through me to bring others to Jesus. Make that your prayer right now as we sing. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what I Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, we welcome you. Your 
Father, we need you. We need your spirit because, Lord, we can't do it. We can't be the dads and the moms you want us to be. So we surrender to you today. As we go to these places, Father, some are going back to school, some are going to go back to jobs tomorrow, and sometimes we feel defeated there. But, Father, I pray that you'd give us the, the, the power of victory, authority as we go in your name. You said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. You send us out with your power, with your blessing. Help us to realize you are with us. And that you indeed will build this church. You will build these families as we surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. But well, we're going to, let's celebrate that. <laughs> I'm excited to see what God's going to do through you this new school year, this new calendar year. Uh, this fall as we go into it, how God's going to use you. And tell me the stories of how God's using you as you serve him. We're going to have our prayer partners up here as we conclude. If you have prayer needs today, maybe this has unearthed something, maybe through our services today, you've realized you have a need. Maybe it's emotional, maybe it's a physical need. You need prayer over. We will be up here to meet with you and minister to you. So as you leave today, if you'd be leave respectfully while those who are continuing in ministry can uh, do that up here, we, we thank you. God bless you. Have a good day.